Midsummer, 1985. Sir, sir, we're preparing to land. Excuse me, but will you please fasten your seatbelt? It seemed I had fallen fast asleep inside the plane. I was finally awoken from my slumber by the stewardess. I only had carry-on luggage on top of it being a domestic flight, so the time between disembarking and entering the lobby was almost non-existent. Arriving at the lobby, I glanced around looking for Oishi, and was met with a familiar gruff voice calling out to me. Akasakasan! <laughs> How many years has it been? It's been quite a while, hasn't it? Oishi-san, it's really been a long time. Oishi clapped his hand down on my shoulder, celebrating our reunion. Akasaka-san, you're looking pretty good. You look like a bona fide frontline investigator now. You're looking quite dapper yourself. Your posture seems a lot better. Is the ballroom dancing paying off. <laughs> you should give it a try while you're still young. It'd be a hit with the ladies. A real babe magnet. <laughs> Oishi had retired and moved to Sapporo, and of all things had started taking ballroom dancing lessons. He had apparently gotten really into it and had decided to spend the rest of his new life devoted to that hobby. He was aiming to get his instructor's qualifications before he hit 80 and live out his old age daintily. Dandily. Dandily? Dandily. 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 I let myself into Oishi's car and we headed out towards the Hot Springs Inn. I had originally intended to crash at Oishi's place, but Oishi was was quite obstinate that his home wasn't a suitable wasn't a suitable for that? Wasn't a suitable for that? I was his home wasn't suitable for that, so it came to this. At the end, we relaxed while soaking in the hot springs, reminiscing about the time we played Mahjong together in Hamanazawa. It seemed that to celebrate our reunion, Oishi had looked for people who could play, but unable to find a suitable candidate, we had to give up on putting together a table. As we drank together, we excitedly recounted our exploits during the final manhunt. Did they end up catching those two guys? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why that's so funny to me, but it is. <laughs> oh, crikey. Nope. In the end, the search team never found them. They were probably hidden by the villagers, then sent overseas or somewhere else far away to lay low for a bit. Oishi-san, if I remember correctly, you managed to grab one of their guns, didn't you? Did you learn anything from that? It was a Chinese-made military pistol. It'll probably from one of the gangs in Kensai managed to smuggle a ton of them. We tried to get a match from the rifling, but it didn't show up in any other cases. How about on your end? After that, I was removed from the front line, so I don't know much. In the end, it seemed like everything was settled under the veil of secrecy. <laughs> Oishi smiled wryly as he sipped his chilled drink. What happened after that sure was tough, huh? This'll be seven years now? Yeah. We held, a we held the memorial service a few days ago. I've become estranged with my father and- Wait. Oh. What happened after that? Sure was tough though, huh? This'll be seven years now. Yeah. We held the memorial service a few days ago. I've become estranged with my father-in-law lately, so it was rough getting everything ready. <laughs> that must have been a lot of work. It was then that the hostess brought in the extra drinks that we had ordered before. While the bottles of beer clanked as she brought them in, we halted our conversation. 
what Oishi meant when he said it must have been tough. Thinking about that was still hard, but time had healed the wound. It was the day after. When I phoned Oishi to apologize, when I did, Oishi almost immediately handed the phone to one of my colleagues who happened to be there. Not only was I injured in the brawl with the suspects, but I disappeared to drink late into the night without leaving any sort of contact information, so I thought he'd definitely be mad. However, all he said was that it was something he couldn't talk about over the phone, and that I should come to the station as soon as possible. At the time, I could only think that he must have been really pissed off. But when I arrived at the station, he said this. It seems your wife was involved in an accident. Having no idea what had happened, I borrowed the phone to contact the hospital Yuki was staying at. After being given the runaround several times, I finally was able to talk to someone in charge, and after mincing words for quite some time, they told me. Yuki Akasaka was... killed in an accident. The world became a blur as I sat there dumbfounded. Yuki's death was unbelie unbelievably abrupt, unbelievably sudden. I could have understood if there was some kind of problem during the birth, but Yuki's death wasn't anything like that. On the stairs on the way up to the roof, she just happened to slip and fall. And she just happened to fall on an unfortunate place at an unfortunate angle. That was it. Wanting to blame Yuki's death on somebody, I began to think that it was an act of revenge by the Defense Alliance, that they killed my wife and made it look like an accident. What I learned when I flew back to Tokyo, however, was much more cruel than that. Yuki had a habit of going up to the roof to cool off in the evening. There was an elevator up to the seventh floor, but from there you had to take the stairs to get to the roof. Even late in her pregnancy, when the evening came, she would always head up there. Her father had always said for her not to push herself, but Yuki insisted that until the time she had no choice but to stay in bed, she would still be able allowed to do as she wished. However, I had never once seen Yuki go up to the roof. I only heard that from her father and the nurses. That was because whenever I visited her, she would spend that time with me instead. I hear heard the reason why Yuki went up to the roof from a nurse who had become f who she had become friendly with. She said that her husband was away on business a lot of the time, and that whenever he called, she was able to cheer him up and give him courage. But when he didn't call, she couldn't do that. Her husband might put on a show of bravado, but in reality he grew lonesome pathetically fast. She was probably just the same. Whenever he left for business, not clear when he'd be back, she felt very lonely. Whenever she'd cheer him up, she was actually cheering herself up as well. That's why, whenever he went far away for an important job, on the evenings he didn't call, at the very least, she felt that standing underneath the same sky, her feelings would reach him. At that moment, I remembered the words that girl had told me. That it was best that I go back to Tokyo right away. Otherwise, there would be something I'd regret horribly. Yes, that's it. Because I was away on business that day, Yuki had headed up to the roof. Had I known that this would have been the result, had I done as the girl had said and dropped everything to head back to Tokyo, I might have been with Yuki on the day she died. If I was with her, she wouldn't have gone up to the roof. The day my wife died was on the evening of the third day of my trip. Yes, it was right before the time I had the sudden urge to hear Yuki's voice and ran around the village trying to find a phone. The girl had gone around and cut all of the phone cords. If she hadn't, and I had made that call, I would have undoubtedly learned of Yuki's death at that time and collapsed in tears. Of course, even though the cords were cut, it had only put me off learning of Yuki's death by that one evening. In the end, I had learned of it the next morning. However, when I managed to put my emotions in order, I realized it was that girl's small token of consideration. That's the first time I've heard about that. Yeah, it's the first time I've talked about it. 
<laughs> could, could it have been a coincidence? She doesn't have any special powers or anything. Aren't you the one who told me, Oishi-san, that she might be the reincarnation of the god called Oshiro-sama? Well, yeah. The old folks in the village believed that Rika Frude had divine powers. Divine powers? Oishi had originally said it, was a it as a kind of joke, but realizing that I was serious, he slumped his shoulders. <sighs> oh, I don't know if it's true. It's the truth or not. They said she did things like prophesize the future or talk about things she have she could have had no way of knowing. That she was clairvoyant, that it was divine revelation. Well, all sorts of things. Of course, they couldn't give specific examples though. <laughs> she prophesized Yuki's accident. I wish she tried to laugh it off, but out of respect to my deceased wife, he kept it restrained. Does that mean an active and capable investigator from the M Metropolitan Police Department believes in Devon powers and cases? Having him say that so bluntly, I couldn't respond. Of course, I had no intention of believing such odd things, but he could only say that because he didn't know what I did. Since I met that other girl, who both was and wasn't Rika Furude, I couldn't deny the existence of any other wor otherworldly entity. Of course I can't deny that it might not have been pre-science? Pre-science? Is that how that's said? That's how it's written. Alright. It might not have been pre-science, but rather a warning. Not pre-science, but a warning. What if that girl has said... If what that girl has said was a warning about Yuki's accident, then things became much easier to understand. Basically, the line of thinking became that it was a threat because I didn't go back to Tokyo. My wife was killed in a way that made it look like an accident. Not satisfied with the investigation into your wife's accident. Of course, I suspected foul play. I pored over the results and even carried out my own personal investigation. There aren't, weren't any witnesses to Yuki's fall. There was the possibility that someone had hidden, waitin', waiting to push Yuki down the stairs. However, the cleaning ladies frequented the roof to hang laundry, and the security cameras on each floor hadn't recorded anything out of the ordinary. There wasn't anything set up on the stairs, and I was unable to find anything suspicious. In the end, even after my personal investigation, I can't think of anything else that happened other than a simple accident. Eh. Well, of course... There were the guys that took the minister's grandson hostage. It wouldn't be impossible for them to push a lone pregnant woman down the stairs without leaving any evidence. Oishi's expression had completely sobered up. I... murdered your wife? When Yuki died, I thought that as well. More precisely, I wanted to blame somebody, so I created the most viable scapegoat but without any clear evidence, that violent notion faded along with the wounds in my heart. Did that girl know beforehand about my wife's death and was threatening me? Or did she prophesize that death and was offering me a road to salvation? If I had to choose between the two, I would tend towards the latter. Oishi smiled slightly in disbelief as he poured more beer from his bottle. Then if I may, if what you say is true, then Rika Frude was a prophet who knew the future. If so, why didn't she predict that disaster? If she knew that the gas eruption was going to happen, why did she remain silent? Even a few hours beforehand would have been enough. If the village knew, then most of the people would have escaped without dying. It was near the end of June 1983. Volcanic gases from the Onigafuchi Swamp erupted and hit the village in the middle of the night. It was an unprecedented disaster where the whole populace was wiped out. 
It caused a wave of panic about volcanic gas across the country, causing people to overreact over any reports of odd smells. I hadn't heard of the blockade in Hamnazawa area being lifted, so it should still be cordoned off. That's... Hmm. It was my turn to be lost for a response. Well, if Reika Frude, the reincarnation of Oshirasama, was killed, then the village might have incurred the god's wrath, making him call forth the miasma from the swamp to kill everyone. That explanation is what the survivors are whispering about. Sorry, Oishi-san. Did you just say she was killed? Huh? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't think it would be a problem if I told you. When I saw the news about the gas disaster, I remembered that girl. Then I found her name in the list of victims. That's why, at the time, I thought her own death she had predicted was due to the gas. It was after that that I learned from the tabloids of the series of mysterious deaths in Hamnazawa occurring the five years leading up to the disaster that became known as the Curse of Oshiro-sama. And that string of mysterious deaths lined up exactly with what that girl had predicted, so I had always thought to ask Oishi about it, as he had been involved in the investigation. That's right. That was the reason for our reunion. But right now, Oishi had said, Rika Furude didn't die in the disaster, but was killed? Can I ask you about the last year of the curse? Eh, I might be retired, but I still like to keep things confidential, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. Do you have any cold that... Do you have anything cold that's brewed locally? High grade if there is. I'll leave the selection to you. <laughs> oh my, I, I didn't mean it that way. Oishi laughed loudly, not wholly unsatisfied, and stopped the hostess to tell her that the cheap booze was fine. Oh wait, I get this. That was a weird off-the-cuff exchange, but whatever. I know as much as was written in those magazines, but I don't know anything about the curse that happened the year of the disaster. Because the entire area around Hominozoa was sealed off, you see. There wasn't much of an investigation that could be done on the last year of the curse. Even after several years of the quarantine is... Even after several years, the quarantine is lifted. The villagers are mostly dead, and what few survivors there were mostly went to stay with their relatives. Their whereabouts are mostly unknown. It's a complete dead end. Oishi seemed to postulate to himself as he stared at the ceiling, as if trying to work out a memory from the rusty cogs in his head. And then, he said in a completely sober voice, The magazines made it seem like the curse of the fifth year was that disaster. But the actual curse really happened on the day of the Watanagoshi Festival. A photographer by the name of Jiro Tamatake, he was the victim. Oishi gestured about how the victim tore out his own throat with his fingernails as he talked. And the burnt corpse of the woman Tamatake was in a relationship with was found in the mountains in Gifu. The Gifu prefectural police weren't very cooperative, so I don't know much about it, though. There were two victims in one night? Hmm. Actually, see, it wasn't just those two. You see, the next day, Kumagi-kun, one of my subordinates, disappeared along with his car in the middle of an investigation. Kumagi was a younger detective that was going to be partnered with Oishi after we first met. He was going around the village to question people about the incident with Tematake. He might have gotten caught up in something. If he was with me, he might have been safe. Even now, it still stings. That day, for some reason, I did a real number on my stomach. I had to pass on going around outside. He got too close to the truth and was made to disappear? That's what I think. Kuma-chan was young and still had a promising future ahead of him, but he still didn't have enough experience on the scene. 
He wasn't used to dealing with any complications. Oishi lamented the fact that he wasn't with his subordinate that day. And then, the next day, see? Uh, you know his name as well, Akasaka-san. You know Dr. Ori. You remember him? Ah, uh, that young doctor from the hospital? I vaguely remember. For whatever reason, he committed suicide with sleeping pills. No suicide note or anything. The autopsy confirmed that it was the sleeping pills. Nothing was in doubt except for the motive. If... It isn't that hard to make it look like somebody died from taking sleeping pills, is it? Any possibility it was murder? He was single, no prior marriages. It didn't seem like he was going out with anybody in particular. He was the coach of the local junior baseball team and was on good terms with the villagers. He was liked by everybody. I couldn't find anybody who'd want to do him harm. Well, any chances to investigate were ruined by the disasters, though. There's no way to find out anything about him now. Then, what about Rika Frude's death? It was the day of. Around noon, some of the old folks who were visiting the shrine discovered the corpse of Rika Frude. Murder? Before we continue, you should probably stop eating that squid suman. That bad? I wish he nodded firmly. The corpse was found in the shrine grounds, next to the donation box. Although she was probably killed somewhere else. That's because while she was that's because while she was completely naked, there wasn't any dirt on the soles of her feet. Any sign it was some sort of sexual assault? According to the autopsy, there wasn't any indication of that. What we know is that she was rendered unconscious by some sort of drug, carried to, out to a place, and then had her abdomen sliced wide open. Her organs were deliberately removed and scattered about. Unconscious? Then she wasn't cut open after her death? That's... horrible. That girl's prediction was right on the mark. I'm pretty sure she was more detailed about the other deaths that led up to her own. For example, I think she said that the housewives that had beaten to death on the fourth year had her head split open. Then, in that case, did she know that her own death would be so terrible? There must have been some moments where she wanted to doubt the validity of her own predictions. But, as people died exactly as prophesied, as the years passed, that prophecy would only come closer to fruition. Then, at facing the final year, unable to struggle against her own destiny, her all-too-young life was snuffed out. And in such a cruel way. Knowing that her days were numbered and unable to fight the tide of events heralding her end, my heart ached at her helplessness. About the way she died, it seems like it wasn't just somebody's sick tastes. What I'm saying is, I've told you before about how Minazawa used to be home to demons, didn't I? Yeah, I think I remember. The festival in Hominozoa Village, Watonagashi, the Cotton Drift, seems to stem from the drifting of entrails. It seems that it came from the man-eating demons ripping apart their victims and throwing their organs into the river. In other words, in Hamanazawa, pulling out entrails had some sort of religious meaning? Well, this is according to the old tales in Hamanazawa, you see. To act as an arbiter, arbitrator, so that the humans and the man-eating demons could live together peacefully, a god known as Oshiro-sama descended from the heavens. If I recall, Riko Furude was said to be the living incarnation of that Oshiro-sama, wasn't she? Yeah. So, cutting open Riko Furude, who was a living god, could be, would be to the village nothing less than absolute sacrilege. Absolute sacrilege? In other words, you mean sacrilege towards Oshiro-sama? Or, the rest you should know, Akasaka-san. The wrath of Oshiro-sama would incur that same night. The Great Hamanazawa Disaster. 
The official explanation was that some swamp upstream erupted with toxic volcanic gas which enveloped the village. The, s the swamp where it erupted was called Onigafechi Swamp. It was the origin of Hominozawa's old name, Onigafechi Village. According to the village law, the depths of the swamp apparently lead to hell, where the man-eating demons came from. That almost seems too perfect. Ah, oh, no, 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 no. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There was another bit of folklore in the village. If Oshirasoma became angry, the cauldron of hell would open up and a miasma would flow out. Well, so they say. To the villagers, hell was at the bottom of the swamp. So basically, the miasma poured out, smothering the village? Yeah. Basically, due to the sacrilegious way that Rika Frude, the living incarnation of Oshirasoma, was killed, the village incurred the wrath of Oshirasoma in the form of that disaster. That seems to be their explanation. So what you're saying is that the disaster wasn't a natural one? Hmm. Well, everything does seem to fit together a little too well. If Oshirasama's curse doesn't really exist, and everything really was just a matter of coincidence, I would doubt it. A wry smile formed on Oishi's face as he listened to my absurd take on things. He wore an expression as though, even if it were absurd, there was a time he had thought the same thing as well. In regards to the religious beliefs of the villages, suppose there was a more fanatical following among them, and that group created a situation that would incur Oshirasama's wrath, and enacted the disaster to make it seem like the truth. Of course, I won't laugh. I've wandered down that line of reasoning more than once myself. Wait. Ugh, God. Now it's getting confusing who's talking. In regards to the religious beliefs of the villagers, suppose there was a more fanatical following among them, and that group created a situation that would incur Oshirasama's wrath, and enacted the disaster to make it seem like the truth. Of course, I won't laugh. I've wandered down that line of reasoning more than once myself. However, even though Hominozawa is a small village, it still has a population of over a thousand people. To murder that many people in a single night doesn't seem realistic, no matter how you think about it. The gas eruption was believed to have happened around 2 a.m., several hours before dawn. In that short amount of time, going around and killing all the villagers in a way that made it look like a poison gas didn't seem feasible at all. The swamp the gas erupted from still had some religious significance, didn't it? Wait. The swamp that gas erupted from still had some religious significance, didn't it? If that's the case, then maybe there was something set up in the swamp, something that could be activated whenever a divine verdict was rendered. According to the JSDF press release, the swamp was declared the source of the eruption. This was after everything was thoroughly looked over by their investigative team. If anything like that was set up, I think they would have found it. It wouldn't necessarily have to be in the swamp itself. Come on, haven't you ever heard about it? The old story about how when a faraway spring dried up, the village spring dried up as well? What do you mean by that? Many waterways are connected by underground aquifers. Swamps and springs are only the parts that manage to pop up above the surface. <laughs> So what you're saying is that Onigafichi Swamp is connected to another swamp or spring? And there's something that the villagers rigged up there long ago. Something that changes the pressure of Onigafichi Swamp, causing it to erupt with poison gas? Is that what you're getting at? Oishi laughed heartedly, commending the fact that the youngins have a nice flexible way of thinking. That was the former detective in him. Even though it was a hypothesis that he didn't come up with, he still had the presence of mind to not dismiss it right away. That's an interesting theory. If that proves to be true, then it would be, unprecedentedly, the largest mass murder in the history of Japan. 
Once the quarantine in Hamanazawa village is lifted, I think it should definitely be investigated. Oishi-san, do you still have any connections with the XX Prefectural Police? Eh, somewhat. I'm an honorary advisor for their judo classes, so even now I pop by during summer training camps and such. I don't know when the quarantine on Hamanazawa Village will be lifted, but please, let me help investigate. Got it. Hoishi-san, how do you feel about the string of mysterious deaths in Hamanazawa they call the Curse of Oshiro-sama? At the time, the villages were putting a lot of pressure on the station. The official stance on things was that it was, the cases were unrelated. That each case was separate, each with its own resolution. That couldn't be. Even though it was blatantly obvious that the cases were connected, based on the village's, village's religious beliefs? Akasakasan, we can only say that now because of the rather grandiose way things ended after five years. At the time, those coincidental incidents just happened to coincidentally occur on the day of Watanagoshi. Just like, it would be nice if nothing happened this year kind of feel about it. Coincidence? The girl predicted everything from the beginning. Gail. Rika Frude. That child warned me about all the incidents that would happen afterwards. Akasakasan, is that true? Yes. That girl said as much. That the next year the damn foreman would be killed and his corpse dismembered. Not only that, she warned me of all the events that would transpire in the following years. Akasakasan, when she told you all of that, what year was it? When I met the young girl, I was investigating the kidnapping incident, so June of 1978. The year before the dismemberment murder. Wrinkles formed between Oishi's eyebrows as he was closed his eyes and began to digest what I just told him. Akasakasan, if you're wrong about Rika Frude knowing the future through some divine medium, this is getting ridiculous. Yup. If you're just trying to shock me, I'm going to be really angry, you know. I'm speaking the truth. Then the script behind the chain of mysterious deaths was written a year before the event started. And, just as predicted, Rika Furude was killed. At first, I thought she meant that she would be killed in the disaster. However, now I know that her death wasn't due to that, but rather an atrocious one at the hands of a murderer. She said she would be killed. At that point in time, she knew more or less how her own death would occur. Then, why didn't Rika Frude not try to run away? Even if her death was already spelled out for her, knowing that, she still had a grace period of several years, didn't she? She had plenty of time to try and run away or consult the police. Why did she just accept her death with no resistance? I don't know. Even though Rika Frude was doted upon by the older folks in the village, you see, after she lost her parents, she had no living relatives, and lived a fairly solitary life other than hanging around with some close friends. It might have been she didn't have any power to fight or anybody to rely on. She must have tried signaling somebody for help in regards to her own death, though. You know very well that the village and the police are, weren't very amicable with one another, Akasaka-san. At the very least, I never heard anything about Rika Frude seeking protection from anybody. Or, it could be that she simply resigned herself to being a religious sacrifice. It could have been something like that. There is no way that was the case. I spoke decisively. At that time, she had said it. She s had definitely said that she wanted to live happily, that she wanted to spend her time surrounded by her dear friends. She hadn't given up on life. She had hoped to keep on living. <sighs> At that moment, I became dumbstruck. What's the matter? Akasakasan? No, it it's nothing. I fell into silence. 
Oishi folded his arms and began murmuring in contemplation again. Eventually, he stood up and headed towards the hallway to find the hostess, yelling that he wanted a pen and paper. When Oishi, noisy even though he was just thinking, left, the room immediately fell into a chilled silence. I stood up. It was then that I realized that I was drunk enough to be unsteady on my feet. When I slid open the window, a beautiful yet somehow ephemeral moon drifted across the night sky. It was just now that I realized she hadn't accepted her own death. She wanted to keep living, happily and joyously. She had said that quite clearly to me, but I was a fool. I hadn't been asked explicitly, so I hadn't realized it. She had made it clear as day that she didn't want to die. Wasn't that her cry for help? She didn't say as much that she wanted help, but even given that, it wasn't as though she wasn't looking for salvation. Without any family and unable to trust the police, she instead told somebody without any relation to the village, somebody from f a faraway place. Me. Help me. She had gone around and cut the phone cords. If I had made that phone call and learned of Yuki's death, I probably would have fallen into despair. If I was in that state, even if she was looking for help, her cries would have fallen on deaf ears. That's why, knowing everything, she had cut the phone cords. She wanted even a little time to seek help from me. Oishi, just before now, had lamented that one of the younger officers gotten mixed up in the case, having been erased because he wasn't there. I was feeling the same way. If only. I was there in June of 1983. I could have protected her. In 1983, it would have been five years since the kidnappings took place. While raising the only daughter Yuki had left me, putting all my youth and passion into my work, honing my wits and courage, wrestling with difficult cases, nothing like my failings during the kidnapping incident would have occurred. I wouldn't have been slow to react in a one-on-one -on -one fight, and I'd by that point and I'd by that point I jumped into foreign mafia run gambling po oh, oh my god. This sentence structure is terrible. And I'd by that point I'd jumped into foreign mafia run gambling parlors where I'd learned to deal with automatic weapons, let alone handguns. I had grown up so much that in 1983 I could have even compared. I couldn't have have. I had grown up so much that in 1983 I couldn't have even compared to how I was in 1978. That's why, if I was by her side, I should have been able to save her life. No matter what conspiracy or foul plots drew near, I definitely would have protected her. She, even though sounding resigned, should have still been able to ask me for help. I just didn't realize it. I, I couldn't realize it. Just as I wouldn't have realized it if I was told of Yuki's accident, I wasn't able to realize it. I wanted to cry. If I had taken her words to heart, I would have prevented Yuki's accident. And I would have been able to protect the girl to whom I owed a debt from even a predetermined from even a predetermined death. She must have been expecting that from me. I learned about the disaster while watching television in my house. Until I learned about that, I had forgotten about Hamanazawa. In order to recover from the shock of Yuki's death, I had tried to remove everything about the place from my memory. What an ungrateful fool I was. Even though in exchange for saving her, the girl had told me of a way to save Yuki. I was unable to accept her gratitude, and now, here we were. She hadn't died in her sleep due to a natural disaster. She was split open while still alive, killed, suffering the degree of having her organs... She was split open while still alive, killed while suffering the disgrace of having her organs torn out. She must have known beforehand that on that day, on that year, she would be killed in such a terrifying way. But even knowing that would, even knowing what end awaited her, she was all too weak. 
a lone girl without anybody to rely upon, unable to seek help, and had to swallow her own predetermined death, and left this mortal coil. She said she wanted to live. She said she just wanted to live happily. That's all she wanted. She didn't ask for anything extravagant. For any person that was ever born, it was the very basest of desires. She never said a peep about wanting money, or that she wished she was somebody else's situation. She had just said it. If that... That if all deaths were preordained, then hers was probably also all according to plan. She might have been a lone, frail girl, but I don't think she would have accepted it all without at least putting up a fight. There must have been, in some small way, some form of resistance that she mustered. And, with what she could muster, seeking my help was a part of that. God damn it! I howled. I stomped the floor. Why did I become a police officer in the first place? How could I call myself an officer if I couldn't save a single girl from the misfortune that was awaiting her? Was it because there was so much going on that time I couldn't process the fact that she was asking for help? Yeah, that's right. I was still green. If I was in that situation now, I would definitely have been able to help her. But it was already all over. If, even if I wanted to settle the regrets she left behind, Hamanazawa as a dangerous area was still quarantined. Most of the people involved were already dead, with the few that did remain spread around the country unable to be traced. The stage of that tragedy was still off limits as well. The police investigation was put on hold, the case slowly being buried in the sands of time. Just like how I wouldn't have known unless Oishi had asked me about it. Akasaka-san, are you okay? At some point, Oishi had returned with a notebook in hand. Until I saw the expression on Oishi's face, I didn't realize that I was in tears. I never realized. I never realized she wanted help. Akasaka-san, calm down. But it's all too late now. She was killed in such an atrocious manner. She was counting on me, but I couldn't save her. I couldn't save her! I might also be at fault there for not building up an amicable relationship with the village. If Rika Fruita had told me about it, I might have been able to extend a helping hand. I wasn't able to build up enough trust for that. That's something I regret. When Oishi said the word trust, it weighed on me even more. Yes. She had given me her trust. She trusted me. Meaning that she thought that I would have been able to ward off the fate of her foreseen death. She believed that. I cried. I fell into my hands and knees as I began to bawl. Eventually, Oishi spoke quietly. Akasaka-san. Does it upset you? It does! Then... There's only one way worth mentioning. For Rika Furude to have her revenge. Is there really? Is there a way to do that? Oishi showed me the pen and notebook. In order to properly mourn the death of Rika Furude, we have to at least find out the truth. The truth? Yes. And not just Rika Furude. Lots of people died. Their lament must be immeasurable. But their deaths were left unsettled because of the disaster. And now, we can't even investigate them, as their memory fades into oblivion. Many people died. The old man was killed, Kumachan was erased, everybody was a victim. But the police can't even investigate it. He's going to take care of their parting regrets. Only we can. Akasaka-san. We find the truth. Yeah. We'll find it. Well, I've been around every one of the string of mysterious deaths, and now all of the inner workings of the village. You were told an important truth the year before they happened by Rika Frude. We can do it. But they're already dead. Uh, that's right. 
Rika Frude died. You were too inexperienced so you couldn't save her. Ugh! I wish he grabbed me, who was a wreck, and lifted me firmly by the lapels. That's why! To atone for that, we reveal the truth. If what you say is true, then all the incidents were part of some greater design. If that's the case, then how we investigate needs to change completely. I intend to spend the tonight summarizing all of the information you and I... You and I have, and then get in contact with one of my former subordinates first thing in the morning. We're not going to let this case get cold. We're definitely going to crack it wide open. Crack it wide open? Crack it wide open! We will. Several years have passed, but it's not beyond the statute of limitations. Even if the case has been postponed, it's not closed. It's still going. We're going to keep it going. Oishi and I vowed to bring the truth of the case to light and stood up. Everything ended in 1985. I, at least wanting to apologize, had searched for her grave. After the state autopsy, her remains were entrusted to one of the shrine's followers. In the future, when the quarantine on the Hamanazawa area was lifted, they would be returned to her family grave. However, unsure who exactly took the remains of Rika Furude, until today I couldn't even apologize to her. In the future, when the quarantine on Hamanazawa is lifted, all I could do then was wait until whoever that person is returned to the grave. What I couldn't do right now was not apologize to her. Instead, until I was able to meet her again, I would reveal the truth and dispel her regrets. Even now, sporadic eruptions of gas in Hamnazawa area meant that the prospect of quarantine being lifted wasn't happening anytime soon. Most likely, it seemed that she had no intention of meeting me again until I found the truth. That's why the quarantine wouldn't be lifted, or so I thought until the day I grasped the truth. It was the following year. Oishi and I co-authored a book on that string of mysterious deaths leading up to the great Hamnazawa disaster. I decided on the title, Higurashi When They Cry. That was because for those few days I was in Hamnazawa, the sound I remembered the most was the cry of the Higurashi. I could only wish that based on this book, those people involved with that incident could refresh their memories and bring to light a new truth. And, more importantly, that nothing like this ever happens again. I wrote this in the afterword. Why did this tragedy happen? We can't reach the truth by ourselves. If you're reading this, please discover the truth. That is our only wish. Kurudo Oishi, Mamoru Akasaka. This year, the quarantine on Hamnazawa still hasn't been lifted. A new scenario has been unlocked. All cast review session has become available. To play it, select extra on the title menu, then all cast review session, and then pick Hamatsubushi. Higurashi, when they cry. And that is the end of this short chapter, or shorter extra chapter. Very intriguing, this last bit of just the main character, Akasaka and Oishi, talking about the aftermath of the event. Apparently, the Great Hamanazawa Disaster is a canonical thing that happens. It's not just a one-off for that story. So, if you assume that it's a canonical thing that happens, af at, the e at the end of each of the first two chapters, uh, Oni Kakushi and Watanagashi, the disaster did happen. It just wasn't talked about because, well, Kiichi was dead by then. Um, but the Great Hamanazawa Disaster is a thing that canonically happens... And what I can see going forward, because the only things after this right now is the answers arc, where stuff will start coming to light, stuff will start being explained, and truths will be completely revealed. Um, I get the feeling that those stories are probably going to revolve around 
breaking this trend and doing things that will prevent the Hamnazawa disaster so that because all like like the uh, extra all cast review sessions keep joking every one of these stories so far is bad ends they're bad ends to a visual novel story like none of them turn out good they all end in terrible horrible murder or disaster or people are dead the main character doesn't survive yada yada blah 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 the answers arcs i feel will start if not getting neutral ends will start getting good ends like it'll start making the series more hopeful instead of dark like they will be there will probably still be like horrible gruesome murder like Higurashi is pretty well known for right now but I feel that like good things will start happening because they'll start circumventing these bad things I keep bumping the table don't I They'll keep circumventing these bad ends, and probably it has a lot to do with Rika. Because if Rika, we're going to assume canonically in each of these stories, knows exactly what's going to happen. She knows that she's going to die. She knows that these incidents have, will happen every year. I feel that the answers arcs will probably be kind of going with her trying to stop them, trying to break the preordained cycle of events. She's trying to make them not happen, and by doing that, we'll change the story and switch what events happen and when they happen and how they happen, and we'll just completely change what we know about Higurashi, even though it'll still be the same characters and same people we know. Um, so I am very interested in the answers arcs. I want some answers, because right now, it's like, why does Rika know all this stuff? That's that's kind of the big question that comes out of this. The last big th question, like I said at the beginning, is Rika. What's up with Rika? In this, we find out that she, for some reason knows what's going to happen up until her own death and the big question that comes from that knowledge is how does she know all of this stuff leading up to her own death and why does she know it like how and why does she know this stuff and now that we know that she knows this stuff how is that going to affect everybody else or what her actions are going to be in the story will she try to act on it to try and do it i mean it's kind of been shown that she has in the past that she's tried to get somebody to do it and i think uh the thing that kind of comes up that you don't really notice in the first couple chapters and i may have to like go back and like go through them is i think Rika tries to get Kiichi to do something. Like, in general, Kiichi is, an, is the third party like Akasaki was. He didn't grow up in the village. He's not with the police. He's just an extra outsider person who comes here. And I think Rika tries to push him towards changing the events. That's why in the first three chapters, it turns out a lot differently. Because I think Rika's trying to... I think what happens is, like, Kichi gets pushed in, like, different directions of how events play out. Because I'm still under the understanding that each of the first three chapters is, like, the a different universe of the same events. Like, uh, Oni Kakushi is one timeline, Watanagashi is another timeline, and, uh, Sim I forget what the last one was called. The last one was really hard to say. Simisabushi? Whatever. It's a... That's the third timeline. They're all separate timelines. I even think that this one is a slightly separate timeline because when Oishi talks about what happened, we find in Simisabushi that Oishi and his car went missing So in this. And in this timeline, Oishi was like, yeah, my stomach was like fucked up and I had to stay there. So my assistant guy went and he disappeared. So... This timeline is separate from the ones that came before. So right now there are four different timelines that have all happened so far in this story. 
all with slightly different events and slightly different things changed. And I think Answers Arc is going to start breaking that. And I feel, I don't know, obviously, but I feel like the Answers Arc isn't going to start up more multiple timelines. I feel like Answers Arc is probably going to be a more consistent singular timeline. But I have no idea until we get to, like, the second Answers Arc thing. Because I assume the first Answers Arc will be a timeline. But it will it won't be until the second Answers Arc will we see if it resets again. And if we do it, do it all again. But, I mean, that depends on reading something that I have no, no ability to read right now because it's not out. Well, I mean, there is an ability to read it because these are old games that came out on, like, the PlayStation 2. And they're being remade for Steam. But I am keeping myself blind. I do not look up spoilers. Sometimes I get images of spoilers because Google searches are assholes like that. But I have no context for some of those things. And mostly they're just like, this person's dead in a weird way. But I already know that pretty much everyone in this series dies in some weird way at some point. So seeing a dead version of a character isn't really a spoiler at this point because I have no context for where or when or why that person is dead, but it doesn't surprise me they're dead, because everyone dies at some point in this series, apparently. Except for... I, Oishi hasn't technically had an on-screen death. I mean, he's... He's missing at the end of uh, Simisabushi, or whatever that's called. He isn't exactly stated dead. Also, this entire chapter gives me a kind of different view on Oishi himself. Like, Oishi in the past has been, like, blamed. Like, when Oishi shows up, shit starts going down. But from this perspective, this is basically Oishi's perspective on things. He's just a cop. Like, that's all he is. He's completely separate. He has no attachment to anything in the village. He's just trying to investigate why this stuff happened. And, like, investigate the murders and just being a cop. He's just... The only thing about, like, from the Hamanazawa perspective on him is they just don't like him. That's it. There's nothing bad about him. They just don't like him. And he fully admits, it's like, well, I I never really tried to be liked by anybody there. I just tried to investigate. That's all he tried to do. That's all he ever does. But everybody in Hamanazawa treats him like some... uh menacing force just because they don't like him so this kind of changes my opinion of oishi of he's just a guy he's not some bringer of the curse some herald of whatever he's just trying to investigate the stuff and he he's a bit gruff he's a bit he's a bit of a drunk he's not the best cop in the world he's not the best detective he he'll scam you he'll pressure you he'll put force when he needs to he's not a good guy per se but he's not bad like he's very he's lawful neutral if i had to put this in like dnd terms he's lawful neutral but like with an air on the kind of like he's kind of a dirt bag thing I wouldn't call him chaotic neutral because he's lawful. He's a cop. He's very that. He's just kind of he does his cop stuff in a very rough, rough way. He's a cop made out of sandpaper. That's the best fucking explanation I can come up with. Also, his kimono thing at the hot springs art was hilarious and funny. Uh, So, yeah, that's the end of Himitsubushi and I've probably been talking a bit too long but uh the next one will be the first of the answers arcs according to the all cast review session from the last one it'll be with shion as the main character which is very interesting uh i wonder if it'll i wonder if it won't be a bit of a prequel again uh because like i said with the spoiler screenshots i've seen a lot of screenshots where satoshi is still around and shion and satoshi had a thing i believe um, because the only reason Shion kind of left and separated was after Satoshi left. So I wonder if it won't be a bit of a prequel thing again, where Satoshi 
and Shion kind of are doing a thing like before Kichi shows up that year before when Satoshi was around. That might be an interesting place for the next one to start. Um, but yeah, in general, super excited for when the answers art comes out. At the moment, I have no idea when this comes out because this one just came out like a week ago. So if their production schedule seems like it's going to keep on track, it'll still be a few months before the next one. Especially since the next one's a full length visual novel and not a shorter one like this. So until then, I'll see you next time. We got the all cast review section for this one coming up. Uh... That may or may not shed some new light on things, but in general, those tend to just be some fun conversations with the cast, which the cast of this might just be main character Enoishi, Rika, and Mio, maybe? Unless everyone just gets on it and they can finally do Rena again. <laughs> if you haven't guessed by now, Rena's my favorite voice, but I'm digressing. See you all next time.